the newspaper, which was trying to harm me, destroyed it in a matter of days. I became known as the Survivalist Rapist, or the Green Beret Rapist, and it all came out about me being ex-Special Forces Green Beret. All the stuff denied by Christianity Today and Logos, and all of these over the years, was just blown away in a matter of moments. Over the next two weeks, it went from what I was suspected of 80 rapes to 100 rapes. Every day the solicitors was holding a news conference. Every day I was smeared in the news. In fact, when they realized that either what they could frame me of was falling apart on them, they proceeded to take my picture and put it on the television. We know he has done all this. Would anybody who has been followed by this man please come forward? They broadcast my picture all over the state, and I imagine I was told hundreds of crank calls, but nothing ever came out, because nothing had ever happened. And the problem was... And we're only guessing here is the solicitors had been tricked by SLED. The solicitor really believed this, and he thought it was high publicity case and blew it up on him, and he was embarrassed. But he was being asked, we uncovered this. This is how it went before my arrest. And I think you will be surprised by lies, or irony, in all this. SLED took the statements from Merrill Blackburn, 2.30 a.m. Sunday morning, 17th. I'm sorry, May 18th, Monday morning. It was actually Monday morning, May 18th, 2.30 in the morning. They arrested me at 3.30 in the afternoon. After taking statements of close friends of Storm Thurman, who was sexually involved with the woman, who was all these women's bosses, came down to Slade headquarters, went with them to Solicitor James Anders' office and told Anders he wanted me sent to prison. He didn't care how. He then went to the state magistrate and got a warrant signed. This politician who lived hundreds of miles away came down here for that precise purpose and was involved. His name was Larry Martin. Now, the reason that Storm Thurman hated me, in case you're familiar or not familiar, was this. It was that when I was living in California working with Chick Publications and preaching very heavily in 87, and doing mostly expose, exposes on everybody that had come out about Storm Thurman being the highest ranking Mason in the world, and that he was also a member of the voting board of regents for Bob Jones University. Now, the first thing that Bob Jones University did was deny that Thurman was a Mason. But Thurman wouldn't go along with it. He knew he was too well known as being a Mason. So he came out and tried to defend the Sonic beliefs that Christians can be that. It blew up on him, and he became so outraged that even though Bob Jones University was calling me a liar, constantly trying to hurt me, they had to ask him to step down. The lie was not removed. He was only placed to the non-voting Board of Regents. And believe me, he still had all of his power. At that time, I was told Thurman is going to get you for this. I made a major mistake. I didn't pray about this. I met and I let people, supposedly Christian people, talk me into moving to South Carolina. These were the first people to desert me when all this happened. Now, the interesting thing about this was, all for this, the only thing they had was this woman's statement. And it came out that the woman had first went to the sheriff's department. And the sheriff would not believe her because it had been, she was talking about so far back that she admitted on the stand that she never had told anybody that she had never sought medical help. There were some things that I don't want to testify, I don't want to say on this tape because it might offend people, but things she described that night would have required her to receive emergency treatment in order to stay alive if it had really taken place. And yet she said she was not hurt, not damaged, was not bruised, she was not cut, she was not harmed in any way. The situation was this, I was held for nine months in custody awaiting trial. The speedy trial law here was totally disregarded by the judge. The reason I was held so long was this woman moved out of state and did not want to come back to the state. It was not, I believe this, it was not really a conspiracy in the beginning. This was a woman who wanted revenge for being fired. When it got out of hand, she didn't know who she was dealing with. When it had gotten out of hand, it become so publicized, and she saw all these people running around trying desperately to do me in. She ran away. See what happened was that when she went to SLED, they typed my name into the computer that they have there. They have what they call a blacklist, a hit list, that the politicians in South Carolina put people on. When my name popped up, it became a field day, and it just became too much for her, and she left, and they had to force her to come back. Now, whether she was honest with them, or whether they really knew what happened, or what I do, do know, but they completely changed her appearance for the trial. They dyed her hair, they put her in different clothes, they restyled and cut her hair so that this was how much she changed. I had only seen her a couple times, but when she came to the trial, I kept asking my attorney when Meryl Blackburn was going to be here. I didn't recognize her. That's how much she had changed. So people who would have seen her that night, which were alibi witnesses of mine, 
would not have been able to perfectly identify her. That was the plan, and the reason for this is that there were witnesses who could have destroyed her testimony. The most important is lab tests that I have happened to know the Lord was behind. I checked into the hospital within six or seven hours from when she claims this had taken place. It was supposed to have taken place Mother's Day weekend of 87, and like in the wee hours of Saturday morning. On Saturday afternoon around lunchtime, I was checking in the hospital. The test on the admittance was this. It was a test for drugs and alcohol. Now the woman did not know that. Sled and the prosecution did not know that. And this woman claimed in her affidavit that I had forced her to drink and take drugs, and that I was drinking and taking drugs along with her. The urine analysis totally proved her to be lying. There were no drugs or alcohol in my system. And yet, and let me say that, finally it was brought to trial January 21st, which was a Thursday of 1988. The jury was selected. A week, week before I was to go to trial, I had all the funds that I had left. I settled my lawsuit out of court, which was supposed to be $120,000. I settled it out for $10,000, and I gave it to my attorney, who was supposed to spend it all on a private investigator. This private investigator was an ex-sled agent. Supposedly, he tracked down all the witnesses I had told him. There was enough evidence for all this time. I sat there, and I knew it was going to be found innocent. I knew I was innocent. I knew the evidence was there to prove it. And the lawyers came and told me they had lab tests. That they went before the judge and argued against my solicitor and got lab tests admitted into evidence, and it was going to be there. He had drawn, as he put it, 32 witness subpoenas, and he had served most of them, and was going to have the witnesses there, and it was going to be an open show. And so all day of the 21st, I watched the trial, not worried, and yet not understanding what my attorney was doing. My attorney was making me out to be the bad. You see, my attorney wanted me to take the stand, and I say I had an affair with this woman, and she was just upset. And I wouldn't do it. I didn't know at the time that he was in on it. And if they lost, they really weren't going to lose it, this case. If they lost, they wouldn't at least to destroy my reputation. And I couldn't understand where the witnesses were. And I didn't know until this month that they were there. They were just segregated outside of the courtroom. And so all day of the 21st, I listened to the testimony. I was so ridiculous. The juries were laughing at the testimony. That's how ridiculous. I insisted. When some nurses were up for jury duty, I had insisted they get on the stand because they would have been able to believe the medical evidence. I mean, the medical evidence which cleared me, we won right then and there. I couldn't understand my lawyers put a woman on the jury who admitted. It's the transcript that her and her husband had seen the stories and read the stories and already formed a conclusion. Obviously, you have read the stories and the conclusion would have been that I was guilty, right? And as far as the public knew, I was still being suspected of all these. You know, a hundred something rapes and nobody knew these didn't exist and nobody knew they didn't go anywhere. So as this jury took, I couldn't understand it, he said. Oh, don't worry, it'll be alright. I know what I'm doing. Next day we come back. I am still expecting to present a case. The 22nd of January. I still expecting to present a case. They called up a few minor witnesses. The only new witness that they put on the case, they were trying to prove that the publishing company didn't exist. That it was phony. That it was a scam to draw women into it. And that I could rape and do all this type of stuff. This is what the prosecution was trying to prove. These were just too much thousands of dollars. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I'll come testify and blah, blah. Then he turns around and tells the court appointed attorney for the post conviction that he thinks James Corey, that's the attorney's name, did marvelous work for me. Sad. Did the best he could under the circumstances. Yes, I'm innocent, but no attorney could have done better for me, making himself a witness who wasn't unable. But he didn't show up for the trial, though he promised it. This pastor had files in his hand to set me free and refused to do it. I'll let you draw your own conclusion as to why. I did not know the full extent of what my attorney had done to me. I was sent to prison until February 15th, a week or so ago. At the post-conviction in Columbia, South Carolina, the only two witnesses present were myself the attorney for the state. My attorney was testifying for the state. He got on the stand, lied about several several things that needed to be true, that I personally knew to be true. Now, he had told me up until then that the reason he didn't use the lab was that it didn't show a screen for alcohol, and for all these years I had believed him. On the stand, however, knowing that it